Mike Hagel. I'm an associate on the investor relations team here at the Nutrip Accelerator. Here at Nutrip, our goal is to provide founders with all of the tools and skills necessary to build, scale, and fund their startups. Now, one of the biggest determinants that we find of startups' abilities to scale and receive funding is their ability to properly convey their ideas and present their businesses to potential investors in a way that's appealing and intriguing. Given that, I've asked Zoe Leavitt, who is a principal at ZX Ventures, along with both Sunny Singh and Isaiah Washington, who are investors at Insight Partners, here today to talk about some of the do's and don'ts of pitching a startup to venture capitalists. First off, I'd like to say thank you guys all for being here today. I'm super excited to have all of you. Um, next, I'd like to kind of give you an opportunity to just introduce yourselves a little bit more, talk about your backgrounds, and talk about the firms that you represent. Um, Zoe, would you like to start us off? Great. Um, yeah, thanks again, Erin, and uh, happy to be here. Um, so I'm a principal with uh, ZX Ventures, which is the uh, innovation and venture capital arm of AB Bev, the world's biggest beer company with brands like Budweiser, Stella, uh, Michelob Ultra. Um, at CX Ventures, we invest across a number of areas. Um, the first of those areas is uh, early stage beverage startups uh, across both alcoholic uh, and non-alcoholic beverages. Um, we also focus on uh, uh, direct-to-consumer and e-commerce technologies, uh, particularly in Latin America. Um, and then we focus on three areas of uh, uh, kind of emerging technologies, um, looking at, at ways to really uh, help AB and Bev uh, disrupt ourselves before we get disrupted from the outside. Um, those three areas are uh, supply chain and logistics, looking at technologies where uh, we can help uh, AB and Bev optimize our own uh, supply chain operations and uh, assuming that the problems that we face are also faced by other uh, large enterprises. So um, the, the uh, company and startups that we choose to work with that we can validate internally will also be uh, appealing on the open market. Um, we also look at uh, sustainability, um, so things like recycling, sustainable packaging, as well as technologies that can help us uh, upcycle waste streams from the beer brewing process, uh, things like spent grain, spent yeast, etc. Um, and then uh, the investment pillar that I lead uh, is around the future of socializing. Um, so looking at uh, how can we make sure that uh, AB and Bev stays a, a leader in social occasions, even if uh, potentially beer and, and certainly bars and restaurants may be less central to socializing uh, than, than they have been in the past. Um, so within the future of socializing, we're looking at, at areas like uh, the social media, of course, uh, interactive entertainment, uh, new ways that fans are engaging with sports and music, um, as well as the new uh, venues and, and uh, the platforms that are helping bringing people together, uh, both online and offline. Um, so the, the future of the happy hour uh, in a way that is hopefully more exciting than the, the Zoom happy hours that we've all gotten so sick of over <laughs> the past year during quarantine. Um, and then just as a, a bit of personal back, and I'll, I'll mention that we focus on uh, er, mainly on early stage startups, um, a little bit of later stage investing, um, but uh, I, I personally focus on uh, seed through series B, um, glo global focus. Um, and then just a bit of background about me personally. Um, I've been at CX Ventures for about two years, um, previously led uh, CBG and retail tech research for a few years at a company called CB Insights, a startup uh, innovation analytics platform. Uh, previously worked in equity research. Um, before that, spent a little bit of time after college living in, in Shanghai doing uh, market research in China. That's awesome, thank you, Zoe. My favorite part is how uh, passionate you sound about all of it, it's awesome. So it's an exciting area. <laughs> uh, Isaiah, do you want to go next? Tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about Insight Partners. Sure. Yeah, I'll go next. And thank you so much for that introduction, Zoe. I um, am a huge fan of CB, so I use it all the time. So that's really cool. <laughs> um, <Right>. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm Isaiah Washington. We'll you know, start off by giving a, a little, I guess, overview of Insight Partners and what we do over there. Um, so we're, you know, at its core, a software investor. Um, we invest in almost every vertical as, you know, our focus is software and software integrates itself with, with every vertical and has done so even more, you know, in our tenure as a firm. So we've been around for about 25 years and honestly, we've, we've, we've evolved and grown with the industry um, in, in that time span. We 
are more so middle middle stage or middle middle market investors. We usually invest somewhere between the Series A, you know, and the lower end of about an eight million to ten million dollar check. And on the upper end, we honestly, you know, we can get very very high, and and we you know, sometimes operate as a pseudo, you know, venture capital and private equity firm. You know, sometimes we participate in. You know, minority deals. We do majority deals. We've taken you know leverage buyouts. We've taken some companies off of uh, public markets and then taken them private. So we do a, a large range of, of deals at Insight and then have a lot of opportunity to to engage and connect at, at different levels, which is really exciting to me. Um, at Insight, I focus on a team that um, focuses our efforts towards the cyber or cybersecurity infrastructure and developer tools market. So um, generally, I, I look mostly at companies that are selling to developers. That's kind of how I think about it. Um, if, if you're you know, a software platform that you know, developers use to create more software, then you know, those are the types of companies that I look at. Um, background, as far as you know, where I'm coming from, I have a little bit of a background in, in software development. It's uh, software development. Um, realm of things. I uh, worked in big tech, worked at Facebook for a while, um, close to product development um, and, and uh, dealing with the development of, of product and developer operations uh, throughout the company. Um, and also as it related to the building of developer tools that, that Facebook actually used and developed for themselves um, and also offered uh, outside, outside of the organization as well. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, I, I am a former founder myself, um, was a founder for, of a micromobility startup for around two years. Um, and that kind of led me to the invest, investing arena. That's awesome. I love to meet investors that have previous experience as founders. They seem to really understand, you know, how to pitch, how to, how to give the best presentations and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, yeah, Sunny, do you want to go next? Um, I know that Isaiah gave a little background on Insight Partners, but I'd love to hear a little more about your background and then maybe a little bit about what a day-to-day -day work life looks like at Insight Partners. You know, how many startups do you guys talk to? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, definitely. And that's a, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm Sunny. I joined Insight last year, um, focused mostly on FinTech payments, um, but really anything within that software ecosystem that Isaiah alluded to. Um, you'll see me in developing markets like India. Um, you'll also see me looking at enterprise SaaS. Um, we also do, I'd say 20% of our portfolio is things that are not software, but look like software. Um, so consumer subscription companies like HelloFresh and Delivery Hero are some of our most successful investments. And they're certainly not a SaaS company, but they are a subscription company. So I'd say that forms about 20% of our portfolio. And I like to look at deals within that category as well. Um, in terms of my background, I was at uh, Bain and Company in their DC office prior to coming to Insight. Um, I was focused on mostly energy work, um, so software was kind of a, a different step for me, um, and have enjoyed uh, enjoyed working in it ever since. Um, in terms of my day to day, I think that's a, a great question. Um, at Insight, as a firm, we talk to 30 to 35,000 companies a year, which is a, a crazy number. Um, we're 200 people as a firm. I think 70 to 80 uh, people are on the investment team. Uh, and we have an outbound sourcing model. So we are very proactive, reaching out to companies well before, um, you know, they're even raising or thinking of raising. It could be, you know, a startup that was founded a month ago. It could be, uh, as Isaiah alluded to, uh, a private company or a public company listed on the stock exchange um, that we're looking to take private. So we're very, uh, very flexible in terms of what we do. Um, my day to day is, you know, a mix of talking to companies and founders and reaching out and, and being that kind of proactive force. Um, to get ahead and, and keep track of their progress until the time comes for a Series A raise and up. Um, as Isaiah alluded to, age 10 is kind of our starting check size. Um, and I think we've been doing more early early deals, um, especially in today's competitive environment uh, around VC. Um, it's a mix of talking to founders, CEOs, um, you know, explaining what insight is, learning about their companies and exploring mutual fit. Um, it's a mix of doing diligence on live deals, um, whether that's customer calls, whether that's um, building the model out and analyzing a customer file. Um, and it's also, you know, interacting with colleagues and discussing companies and seeing, um, you know, what the feedback is, what people's perspectives are on a company. I think everyone has different takes and that, you know, exchanging of ideas and perspectives on a company is really what leads us to either gain conviction um, or to give feedback to, you know, what makes us um, lean out on this round and, and want to stay in touch with the next. So um, it's really a mix of the investing perspective, kind of the consulting perspective by doing analysis, um, and then some of the investment banking kind of hard technical skills 
Um, so it, it's a really nice mix of all. And, um, you know, seeing pitches and talking to founders um, is, is a big part of my Isaiah's day to day. Um, so we're excited to be here. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that you guys talk to so many startups, even when they're not, you know, maybe meeting the exact criteria that, you know, the rest of your portfolio is at, that you build those early relationships and that you, it shows that Insight Partners really cares about entrepreneurship. You want to promote it in the community. You want to promote the ecosystem. You want to establish it. And I think that's fantastic. Um, so Sunny, you obviously talk to so many startups. I'm sure the rest of you do too. Um, but starting with you, can you, if I asked you to think of like one startup that you met with and you were like, they were so prepared, they were so great. I'm sure you've invested in some from Insight Partners. What can you tell me a story? What was that startup like? What made them look prepared, looked organized, uh, seem like they were going to be a good fit? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, honestly, I think the, those situations, in my experience, are, are just when I'm blown away. Are usually with founders who have run a company before, or have some sort of entrepreneurial experiment uh, experience, or they've been through, you know, kind of an accelerator like New Chip, where they've been trained on how to present versus how not to present. Um, and what are the most effective strategies for getting your point across, being clear, being honest. Um, there was one um, in particular, I had the opportunity to speak with a company called Picasso. Um, and it's uh, former founders, or this was well before they were raising just to kind of touch base, but was blown away by the expertise of the founders. Um, the, one of the founders was the ex-CEO of Zillow um, and another uh, ran a company that was later acquired by Zillow. And these guys were just experts in what they were doing. And it was clear that they knew what their focus was. I think oftentimes I've seen founders try to do everything at once, uh, especially in the early stages, rather than focusing on one core aspect of their business. And you know, I'm a believer that um, once you find product market fit and, and you're speaking with customers, they'll lead you to additional features and additional products and additional rollouts. Um, that should not come first because you don't really know how the market's gonna respond at that point. Um, sometimes the idea is just super brilliant and you know it's gonna work no matter what. Um, but I'd say they, they really blew me away by having to focus on the second home market. Um, so purchasing a vacation home, purchasing the second home, they're kind of gonna be the leaders in that space. Um, and it's clear that with their expertise, you know, they know what they're doing. Um, so I think, uh, even, you know, obviously not everyone has that former Zillow background, but I think really understanding your market and understanding um, what makes, what establishes your product market fit and then potential additional revenue streams from there in the future um, is really what makes me excited. Um, when a founder really knows what they're going after and there's been some reception and there's been some traction that's organic, um, I think you can achieve that with any market. It's really just about finding what the right fit is. Um, so I say that that's what it gets me. Absolutely. And that's great. And like you said, yeah, not everyone can have that experience, but in their journey to building that experience, you know, joining accelerators like ours, like new chip, that's part of our goal is give them that illusion of experience by teaching them all of those skills and the tools that they need to look professional and put together and be organized, you know, cause they might have that great idea, but can they present it? Can they convey it properly? Um, so Zoe kind of moving to you, uh, same question. Do you have a story of, or can you think of a time where you're just like, this company was so put together, they're so great, you know, whether it was the founder or their pitch deck or whatever it was that um, just you think of when I ask you that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with uh, with what Sunny said for sure. Um, I think it's it's really clarity of vision, I would say, that, that really helps uh, a startup story stand out. Um, as you, exactly as you said, Aaron, like anyone, ideas are everywhere. It's about what kind of, what is the most compelling story you can tell about that idea. And I think sometimes the red flags are if someone's starting with a solution rather than starting with a problem, I wanna see that you have a very, as a founder, have a very, very deep understanding of the exact problem that you're trying to solve and the root causes of that problem and how other factors at large kind of in the industry, maybe even in other adjacent industries will impact that problem going forward. Like, is this a problem that will go away on its own and in five years? Or is this something that will, that really does need this new kind of 10x solution to solve it? Um, so I think that deep understanding there, um, exactly as Sunny said, strongly agree with that point of not trying to do everything at once. I think um, that's kind of a, a, another major red flag. It, I actually view it as a strong positive. If I ask, uh, if I ask you maybe about, oh, you've talked about this group of people, what about this group of people? And if you say, no, we're not focused on that problem right now, we're just focusing on this. I think that's not a negative, that's a strong positive to have that kind of 
a clear, immediate focus, um, but then to also pair that with a long-term vision that like, this is, um, this is the mark. And this is something that, um, you know, we see in a lot of star like like Facebook, for example, of course, the, you know, cliche story, but started small on college campuses, but then of course could expand so much broader than that. But you need to gain that strength in college campuses before you can tackle everything. And I think it's, it's important to understand that. Um, and then um, I'm curious, uh, Isaiah and Sunny, since it sounds like you focus a lot on, on the B2B software side as well, um, but I think particularly for B2B startups, um, that really deep understanding of, the cons of, of your customer um, and what is keeping them up at night, which can, of course, be, you know, maybe harder to understand if you're dealing with enterprise customers, but um, understanding who, who the buyer is, who the end user is, those might be different parties, and uh, kind of what are the concerns of each, what is your, your selling story there. Um, and then also, I'd say just kind of thoughtfulness in, in responses, like as a founder, you certainly don't need to have every answer, um, but to show that you've at least thought about um, all different angles that this idea is something you're living and breathing um, and that you, uh, you know, also understand your competition. You're not dismissive of your competition. You can have uh, kind of clearly thought out answers as to why, uh, where, where your differentiation is and, and where you're able to win. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I love the solving, solving a problem pitch. Um, yeah, Isaiah, what about you? Do you have a kind of a story or a startup you think of or some instant characteristics you think of, of but this makes me like a startup when I talk to them. Yeah, sure. I, I'll, I'll keep it more general. First, first of all, definitely like to agree with everything that both Zoe and Sunny said uh, before me. Um, you know, great points that I absolutely use. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm evaluating different companies, something that I'll add on top is um, something that is, I guess, more yeah, more general. I'd say you know having a a good understanding of, of what your investor is looking for and kind of, you know, what stage your investor or the investor that you're talking to at that time invests at, I think sticks out and is really important as well, because, you know, that helps you as a founder essentially cater your pitch to exactly the things that that investor is looking for at that time. So being that, you know, at Insight, we have a very big range, you know, just like Sunny said, we, you know, we can talk to founders that, you know, just started a company last month and it's just them and their co-founder, you know, building their vision. And, you know, if that's the case, I want to hear about the vision. I want to hear about, you know, where this is going, you know, where you see this company, where you see this company being in five years and, you know, what are the stepping stones to take to get there? And, you know, I want to see that you have a good understanding of that. A good example of that, you know, was a company that I talked to not too long ago, actually. Um, and lucky enough, you know, even though we invest at later stages, I personally, you know, we can use our agency to make connections to earlier stages and make connections to early, you know, investors in our network, you know, where we see fit. Um, so a company that I talked to is called Medify and it's a company in Madison, Madison, Wisconsin. They were, you know, fairly early, you know, kind of getting their, getting their, their, feet off the ground when I first connected with them. Um, it was just, you know, the, the founder and a couple of his, his, you know, colleagues really that he had left his former company from with to start this company. Um, and, you know, they hadn't had a lot of traction at the time, but, you know, what they did have was a really great understanding of the technology that they were building because they had just been in the industry of building that technology for however long. And they were able to express that really, you know, robust understanding of the technology that they're building and of the market that they're planning to operate in. And at the time, those are the best things to, you know, to portray to me because, you know, what I was looking at is, okay, you know, do I want to keep tracking this company for, you know, into the future to, to follow their story and you know, follow along with what they're doing. And, you know, the way that they were able to express, you know, their expertise in the technology, their expertise on the market and the vision of what they were building. I absolutely want to stay, stay involved and then know everything that they were doing and how they're moving forward. Um, on the other side of things, you know, if it's a company that, is, you know, large and, you know, they, they've been operating for 10 years already and they have, you know, 5 million in the, you know, in, in you know, annual recurring revenue already, you know, more so, you know, looking for like financials and, you know, or a, a investor that's more so focused on financials or focused at the later stage, we'll be looking at, you know, the financials, okay, the traction, you know, what, what, you know, growth metrics have been experienced in the past year or so, the last six months. And those are more so the things that, you know, they'll be focused on. So the things that stick out to me is, you know, generally a good understanding of, you know, the stage that you're at and what things that investors look for at that particular stage. 
That's fantastic. I love that all three of you mentioned vision, like very consistent there, which is great. Um, it's really interesting. You know, when I talk to startups, like my favorite thing ever is elevator pitches. I love to see like 90 second, 60 second pitches. And I'm like, okay, inspire me, like convince me why this is going to be amazing. Um, but it's really important. Like what you guys said is it's not just about that. Like that is great, but you have to have that balance there of like, okay, give me the big picture of amazing vision, but like, okay, how are you going to get there? Like break it down. Let's see these short-term goals. Like Zoe, Sunny, Isaiah, you guys are all saying like, let's see how you're going to get there. Let's see it broken down. And I think it's an important balance between that. Like when you talk to investor, like you need to inspire them, get them to believe in you, like you, but you also need to show them how you're going to get there. Because if you just have that long-term vision, you, you're going to flop on the steps in between. Um, yeah. So Obviously, this panel is supposed to be focused on the do's and don'ts of startups. Um, they go hand in hand. Um, so let's kind of shift gears. Isaiah, do you have you ever talked to a startup? You don't have to mention any names or anything. But have you ever talked to a startup where you were like, you guys, you know, maybe their idea was okay, but their presentation wasn't good or the founder didn't have a good attitude or something? What were just the characteristics involved with that that you would not recommend doing in a pitch to an investor? Mm, that's that's a great question. And um, definitely have some examples that I can, <laughs> that I can run through. Um, I think, you know, I'll stick to one, um, because I know, you know, Zoe and Sunny want to share some things as well. One thing that sticks out to me as far as, you know, being a negative or being something that, you know, or may, you know, would give off an experience to me in which, you know, I, I don't really know what's going on or I don't want to learn more is, um, I'd say, you know, a, a a way to create that situation is not allowing questions to be asked. I think that's the worst thing that can kind of happen in a startup presentation. Um, and the thing is, you'd be surprised how much it happens because obviously entrepreneurs are very excited about sharing what they're building. You know, of course, I, I'm excited about hearing it, um, you know, every time. But, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, kind of connecting to my last point, you know, it it will veer in the direction that that investor, that particular investor isn't, you know, particularly looking for, or, you know, you could be sharing information that doesn't really matter for the analysis or analysis purposes of that investor, but, you know, it's all great information, but, you know, it's not going to help me get to, you know, the decision-making that I need to make. Right. Um, and I'd say that's, that's tough because, you know, either I'm making the decision to say, okay, you know, I, I had that call, I didn't learn anything, I'm not going to dig deeper, or, you know, I had that call, you know, and I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm not really sure if the founder knows what's going on. And, and it also gives off kind of a bad vibe. Um, so yeah, I'll give that that as my example. That, that's a great point. I mean, the more personal it is, the more conversational it is, the better because investors are people. And a lot of times when you invest when they invest in a company, like you're partnering with that company, like you're helping them build. And so you want to be able to connect with them um, on a little bit deeper level. Like you don't want to just hear the pitch, like you want to ask questions and know more. Um, so I think that's great. Uh, Zoe, what about you? Great. Yeah, um, for sure. I think um, there, there's a few that, that touch on, on points that, I, that we've started to discuss, but um, on describing the problem, describing your solution, and then describing your progress so far. I think that, uh, first of all, that it, inability to clearly articulate the problem that you're solving um, is a, a massive problem. Even if later in the deck, you get to the idea and the idea sounds interesting. If I can't follow what who your target customer is, why is this such a big problem for them? Why has it not been solved already? Um, and why are you in the right position to solve it? I'm not going to kind of be able to or believe that your solution maybe is, is the best one to get there. Um, I think, And then on the solution side, your solution also needs to follow very closely from that problem. Um, sometimes you see pitches where they make a very convincing case that this is a big problem, but then it doesn't quite follow logically that this is actually a solution to that problem. Um, like maybe it is solving something quite slightly different or not even really solving that. Um, so I think that's making sure that that's very, very defendable, that line there. Um, and then you just kind of on the the more concrete side, um, overstating your progress so far, um, especially as an early stage startup, I think, you know, be 
be transparent if you if you frame things that you know you've made massive progress in the market so far and then uh when you share materials uh the next day we see that you're in you know 40 bars or something like that like that's fine but now since you framed it differently up front i'm going to be a little bit suspicious about um other things it would have been better if you have has, had said this is where we are so far and this is our plans to take it to the next step um so i think uh that that kind of overstating is is something that uh it, it, it's a major red flag um, for sure. Um, and then on the, just, just to um, kind of wrap up maybe in distinction to, to insight a little bit um, on the corporate venture side, it's very important um, for me to understand why AB and Bev is exciting to you as a startup um, and why you would be, what kind of strategic value add you see us bringing to, uh, to your startup rather than just being a, a name on the cap table. Um, I think we want things that, um, and, and of course, you know, we wouldn't expect the startup to know about, you know, AB and Bev's long term plans or internal strategy or anything like that, but that um, there's at least a reason why you're excited about talking to us versus other uh, investors in the market. Yeah, it's great that you brought it up. Um, I was actually going to bring that up later, but Isaiah brought it up earlier is I was going to ask how important is it that the startup you're talking to knows some about your company. Like they know about Insight Partners and they know about ZX Ventures and they know what your investment thesis is. They know like what your current portfolio kind of looks like. They know what you normally invest in. Like how important is it that they've done their research before the meeting and aren't just trying to like meet with anybody possible at any time, you know? It, like, it shows, like you said, that they want to be more of a strategic partner, that they want to build that relationship, that they specifically want you guys. Um, so I think that's great. Thank you both for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, Sunny, what about you? Do you have anything to add? Have you talked to a startup that just didn't sit right with you? And can you give a few of the characteristics that were involved in that scenario? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with um, you know most of what's been said so far. Uh, only thing I'd add is that I think for Insight, it's a little different in that we're not necessarily looking for that kind of strategic fit or, or you know, this, oh, I know about his nice history and I know about your portfolio companies. I think that's kind of our job, our onus to explain to them why we're, you know, a good strategic fit. Um, I think it's just different in, in the scenario. And I think, you know, because for us, we can be the partner at the board table. We can also be hands off and let you grow the company, especially the early stage investors in Twitter. I can tell you they didn't really need our help. They're uh, killing it and crushing it. Same with Alibaba and JD.com. So I think it just varies with the stage and kind of the thesis. Um, but one thing I would add, I was actually in this situation yesterday. It was a company that I loved um, from the initial pitch deck. And I thought large raise, you know, great market um, and, and uh, thought they were going to crush it. Um, get to the management meeting and like the full hour was deflection and just not answering the questions that were being asked. I think that's one of the worst things you can do. Um, I agree with Isaiah is that you want to have it conversational. And at the same time, you want to at least address what the investor is asking, even if it's could theoretically be a horrible question. I've asked bad questions because I don't know anything about the business and that happens. Um, but I think instead of just ignoring it, you want to acknowledge it or explain why maybe they're off or why um, you know you, you don't think that's so important. Um, I think this this example I'm talking about was more just not answering the question straight up and there were important questions. You know, what's your monetization strategy long-term? Um, how are you going to hold up against this competition? And the answer was just going back to, this is why we're the best player. This is why we're the best player and we're the only ones that can win. And I think was ignoring key facets of competition. You know, I hear the line that we have no competitors in the world like really often. And I think often, oftentimes that's not true. Um, I can name 10 companies off the top of my head at that time. Um, so I think just being realistic and, and uh, open to suggestions doesn't mean that we're not going to invest in you. It's just we want to learn more about the business. And I think, you know, as, as Zoe, Isaiah, and, and yourself, Aaron, alluded to, I think the character and the values that you embody in that initial meeting go really, go really far because you know, most investors are there for more than a year or two, right? We're, we're in it for the long term and we want to help build the company where we can and be a strategic value add. Um, it's hard to do that if the person's not honest with you, if they're not real, if they're not trying to be clear about what they're doing. Um, you know, it, it's totally fine if it's your first venture or your first investor meeting. You know, it, 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 we don't have, I think, these lofty expectations. I think go, being cordial, being friendly, um, being respectful and just being honest goes such a, a long way. And uh, unfortunately, it, oftentimes when you don't see that, when it does show up, it, it makes a big difference because um, you see someone who's just honest and, and knows their business and is realistic about where they're at, not you know promising you the world um, when they might not be able to deliver the world. And I think um, that gives the investor a lot more confidence and the ability to trust that 
Um, this is a founder that we can back if there are hiccups. We know we can talk this out with them and not have you know, a boardroom fight uh, ends in a Royal Rumble. Um, so I think the, the, the personality traits go, go a long way as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you brought up the fact that like there's a difference between corporate ventures and uh, regular venture capitalists and the fact that, you know, you don't need to know everything about the firm. Like you don't need to know every portfolio company. We're not saying like you need to have a research paper about them and have stalked the person you're going to talk to, you know, just that like maybe they are looking for a strategic partner. So maybe they know not to look at this one or that, you know, it's still good to do a little bit of research to at least know who you're talking to, to know like, are they going to be a good fit? Do I think that I meet these first requirements so I can, you know, go to the secondary requirements kind of thing? Um, so when I think about um, pitching and presentations, you know, I kind of see if I had to boil it down to two, two parts of it, I'd say, you know, the pitch deck and then the entrepreneur themselves pitching the idea. Um, so I don't think we can get through the do's and don'ts of a presentation without talking about pitch decks. Um, so Zoe, do you have anything that you would say absolutely needs to be in a pitch deck that you think is like just one of the most important slides or something? Yeah, I think um, the that that narrative that I, I've kind of talked about a little bit, like this is the problem, this is why it's a big problem, this is the solution, this is why we're the right people to solve it, um, is 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 very strong. Um, of course, any details about the details to support the product market fit to the extent that you've already proven it. Again, if you are in the process of proving it, that's fine. As, as Sunny said, please be transparent about that and then kind of explain. Um, but, you know, really great to see that you are putting in the work to understand that, that you've done surveys, that you've had conversations, um, and that you, uh, you know, of course, especially on, on the B2B side, a bit simpler, but any of those initial clients or client feedback, um, any Ad, ad, uh, changes or uh, ad, ad, ways you've adapted based on initial client feedback, I think is um, is is very positive as well. Um, I think just to and just to kind of uh, double down on, I, I agree so much with the, the point that Sunny made around uh, that you. It's important to understand the competitive landscape, and just if we as investors are asking about competitors, that is, don't take that as a negative. Take that as an opportunity to explain why you are best positioned to solve this particular problem, or maybe why some of the competitors or seeming competitors are not, in fact, competitors are solving slightly different problems. Um, I think that uh, that that clarity again there really helps. Um, and, and kind of along those lines as well, in terms of the questions we might ask, like sometimes we might ask things like, have you, you know, oh, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing this? And similarly, it's very okay to say no there. Um, I think that, you know, we also want to see, especially as a big uh, strategic partner that where we are often coming on as a client, as well as an investor, that you are not necessarily going to pivot your entire business model just based on the first big client that you get, that you do have this clear vision that you um, really strongly believe in. Um, so I think that uh, the, that belief is, is something that really needs to come through as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that all of you have mentioned now the, the art of questions, you know, Isaiah, you mentioned it earlier and then Sunny mentioned it and then Zoe um, is that that's really important is I like what you said, Zoe, is that questions, it's not negative. It's an opportunity. Like you have your little pitch, but then when they ask you a question, they're giving you more time to talk, like more time to give you examples, to give you statistics, to explain to you why their best, their business is the best and why it's going to be great. Um, so I think that's an awesome point that you made. Um, shifting over to Isaiah, do you, um, let's talk about pitch decks positives, negatives. Is there any, I want to touch on negatives too on pitch decks. Is there ever anything you look at a pitch deck, you look through, you see a slide where you're like, this slide should not be in here. Like, what mm. does that look like? Mm. I would say, I mean, you can, you can make a case for, you know, most things to be, you know, I guess helpful to tell your story, right. You know, from the perspective of the founder, the thing that I'd say turns me off the most if I see it in a pitch deck is just an incoherent story you know yeah I don't know if you know founders or you know investors actually hark on hark on design and like you know display 
as much as, you know, I, I, I think it does play a role as far as, you know, just generally telling the story in a coherent way that, you know, makes the most sense. I mean, I, I like to say, you know, I should be able to get a really good understanding of what your company is doing, you know, without even having to talk to you and, you know, to just flip through the slides and, and, you know, understand clearly, you know, like, like Zoe mentioned what the problem is, you know, in layman terms and clearly how your solution solves that. Um, and, and if that is included in a pitch deck and there could be other things, you know, that are auxiliary that, you know, help, help, you know, show that or prove that point or prove those points. Um, but, you know, if that's in a pitch deck, I think, I think it's, 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 it's good. Um, but, you know, the thing that, that would slow that down is just, you know, poor, poor, I guess, visual situations dealing with, with the, uh, the pitch deck that, that would make it hard to, I guess, get those insights from a, a quick glance over from a, you know, even a thorough read through. Yeah, that's a great point because a lot of times, you know, you guys have companies sending you pitch checks before the, they even meet with you. So, you know, if you don't see the problem and the solution and the, the opportunity and the possibility in the pitch deck, then you're probably not going to want to meet with the company to, to see if the CEO is going to be a fit. So that's a really great point. Um, Sunny, do you have anything to add about pitch decks? Good, bad, ugly thoughts on them? Yeah, I think I um, definitely agree with everything that's been said. I think you know, as investors, we're looking for, I think just hitting the core aspects of what an investor is going to be looking for is super important. So when I'm looking at a pitch deck, of course, for a very early company, it's a little different. Um, but, you know, uh, for, for a Series A investment, for instance, I definitely want to see a sophisticated understanding of the TAM and, and what part of that is actually addressable. You know, not just, oh, our TAM is a trillion dollars globally. I think I've seen a lot of that. Um, but how much of that can you actually go out and get? How much of that is addressable to your company? I think that demonstrates a really sophisticated understanding of what is going on and how big our company can get, not just how big our buzzword is. Um, so I think that distinction is, is actually, I don't, I don't see it that often. And uh, it's something that we as investors pay real attention to. Um, really do believe in the vision, but you know, what is the specific market that you're operating in? What are the dynamics of that market and how big can it get? Because I think that determines a lot of uh, company's trajectory. Um, and also explaining you know, the business model or the financials, having some kind of slide that explains a path to modernization if you're not there yet, or what your kind of levers can be that you pull to get there. Um, I think a lot of investors just flip to the end of a deck to see the financial, see the business model on, you know, determine if it's interesting from that or not. I, I think a lot of people do do that. Um, and so including that can, can be really important to just get a sense of where you're at, where the traction is, um, you know, number of contracts, pipeline, et cetera. Um, I think that, that's a real critical part of it because at the end of the day, investors do care a lot about financials and your business model and seeing if that's a fit for the portfolio. So um, having that is always good. So you're not, you know, wasting each other's time. If it's not a fit can determine that before. Um, and I'd say uh, last thing is I always love when there's a team slide or, or some kind of background slide about, cause you're ultimately, you know, you might be meeting with the CEO, but you're investing in an organization and you're investing um, in people who are across the organization. You know, at Insight, we have a team called Onsite, which is basically our consulting for our portfolio companies. And oftentimes they're not working with the CEO. They're working with the VP of engineering or the head of product. Um, or some other operators who really make the company go and, and really do the implementation, not just the you know vision and, and stuff that the CEO uh, often is attributed for. So I think um, you know showing the the brunt of the strength of your organization to the extent that you can, um, the experience of your team, you know who brings the technical expertise, who brings the business expertise, um, or or why are you such a great team overall? Because that is what it is, a team. Um, I think that that's always nice and uh, just gives more comfort um, that you're investing in a really talented group of people, not just one person who thinks they can do it all on their own. That's so great. That's actually the next thing that I was going to bring up is shifting, you know, away from just pitch decks to kind of more the presentation and the CEO. How is it, how important is it? Who presents the company? Do you guys want to see the CEO presenting the company? Do you like it better when the whole team is there? Like if they have a software person or if they have, maybe the CEO doesn't specialize in the financials and maybe they have a CFO. Um, who do you like to see pitching that idea? And do you, do you prefer the whole team there or just, you know, a team slided to show they have someone handling that? Sunny, if you want to, you know, since you brought it up, <laughs> we can start with you. Yeah, I, I can quickly um, tackle that. I think ultimately, look, the CEO probably has to be there just because they, they're most likely the body who's going to make a decision on who to go with for an investment. So I think that's always going to be a critical part of the pitch. 
Um, with that being said, you know, as software investors, we often do a product demo before we invest in a company um, with Steve Rabin, who's our, our CTO in residence, um, helps us vet the technology of a company, understand how defensible the product is long term. Um, often the CEO can't give those technical answers unless they are, they're the person who built the tech stack. Um, so I think in the tech instances where software is really heavy, it's nice to have a product person or to delineate the purpose of the call beforehand, right? If there's going to be a piece where you discuss the product, someone from the investment team's product person is going to be there. I think it makes sense to have that. Um, maybe not for an initial call, um, but I think also having the CFO or someone who's kind of running the, the day-to-day is always helpful um, just to you know, show that there's real interest. Um, you know, frankly, I think having more people always shows that you know, they're, they're really taking this seriously and they're really interested in, in talking to us. I think it always just makes a difference as humans. Um, so I think uh, the more, the better, but within the, the context of the meeting, you know, what are you going to be talking about? Bring, bring the people who are relevant to that. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Zoe, kind of similar question to you. Do you guys, do investors find businesses more uh, appealing if they have a team instead of just one founder, if they have even just a co-founder or a, a team of individuals to help them? Because I meet a lot of entrepreneurs who are like, I don't need help. I can learn how to do financials. I can do it myself. You know, is that less appealing to you guys? Um, yes, that is definitely less appealing. <laughs> um, I think that the team is so important. Um, I, I completely agree that especially for early stage startups, if the CEO, the CEO needs to be the one giving the, the pitch at least, even if, and then of course, please bring in uh, people with technical expertise on your team for later kind of more in-depth discussions, but um, absolutely want to see the CEO and also um, want to see the CEO interact with their own team to some extent, um, because we want to see that this is someone who can scale, um, not just, I mean, of course, a big, an important part of scaling the business is scaling the people. And when I hear uh, founders talk about the importance of hiring the right people, of making sure their team feels valued, that um, really stands out as something very positive to me, um, that they're thinking about this for, uh, for the long term. Um, so, uh, and that, that, that interaction is supportive, that they're a good people manager as, as well as a good business manager. Um, so I think that, um, and you know, we wanna know that it would be a negative if the CEO kind of doesn't understand anything about the technical side of their product, of course. But um, I think that uh, that's also a very strong positive to bring in the people best suited for each individual conversation when you're having those with investors. That's a, that's a really interesting point. I didn't even think of bringing that up, but you know, the CEO, it's really important. Not only can they inspire the investors to like their idea, but can they inspire their own people? Do they have, you know, experienced people that can do the tech, can do the finance that are buying into their idea? Like are other people interested in it? Cause that's, that's a big uh, impact on like, will the business be successful? Do people like it enough to jump on board and do it? That's really interesting. I like that. Um, Isaiah, do you have anything to add a little bit, just talking about characteristics of, you know, a good CEO, a good team, what that looks like, maybe bad ones you've seen or anything to that extent? Yeah, not, not much to add other than what's been said already. And I'll kind of just lead into Zoe's last point that she made, because that's what I was actually thinking about the whole time. Um, you know, just kind of as a hedge to, you know, what was said earlier, definitely would, you know, want the CEO to have a thorough understanding of everything that's going on in the technical side and the finances, even if, you know, CEO is not the expert there and, you know, you don't know, you know, the numbers offhand or, you know, the, the technical aspects of the business, you know, down to, you know, the, the, the bottom level, but do want you to have a, you know, an, an, a general understanding of what's going on and how your product works and, you know, where you guys are at financially, you know, in addition to the strategic direction. Yeah, absolutely. So let's kind of wrap it up a little bit. Let's summarize, you know, do's, don'ts, you know, do be prepared, do look up the investor ahead of time, you know, do be polished, be professional, be on time, you know, do have competitors slides, let the investors answer or ask questions, you know, be conversational, be open, right? Um, You know, have a team, all of those things, anything to add to that, like, just First things to pop on your head, what, what should they do? I think that uh, that clear uh, focus in the near term um, of what concrete steps you need to take in the near term and how you're planning to do that 
paired with a much broader long-term vision that is that very clear kind of this is why this is why this is going to be a you know 10 million dollar business tomorrow and this is why it's going to be a hundred billion dollar business in 10 years um the the combination of, of both of those yeah clarity very important all of you touched on it you know have those short-term goals, have it very specific. How are you going to do it? But also have that inspiration, like have that big vision that you inspire your team with, you inspire the investors with, you inspire the public with to get people to jump on board, you know, while you have the little specific steps laid out. Um, Yeah. And then, you know, don't uh, have incoherent slides. Don't, uh, you know, forget to lay out the problem and then the solution very clearly. Um, you know, don't forget the competitors, all that, you know, the opposites of all the do's that we said. Um, I think we covered a lot of really important things here. And then I'd like to just finish up with one more question. I like to ask this to everybody that I talk to on a panel or pretty much anybody that I talk to. And um, you guys all talk to startups all the time. You know, you're very experienced with that. You see a lot of them. So a lot of entrepreneurs are going to watch this panel, a lot of investors. So what I want to ask is what advice would you give to an entrepreneur, not just about their presentation um, or even advice you want to give to somebody who wants to get into venture capital, you know, just a a little token of advice that maybe helped you in your career or, you know, Isaiah, you said you were a former founder, some little advice that helped you through that. Uh, Isaiah, if you want to go first, unless you need time to think about it. I, I definitely want to give a good one. I am thinking, um, I'd say, you know, a good piece of advice is just to, you know, be as comfortable as possible. I think, you know, when I was, when I, when I was pitching, you know, my, my startup, you know, and and granted it's a, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum and, you know, it's a development that happens over time. And the more you pitch your startup, the more you get comfortable pitching your startup and more, it's just, you know, kind of, you know, becomes just talking. And, you know, when, when you're at the point at which, you know, pitching your startup, pitching your slides, is just, it feels like talking. You know, that's the sweet spot. That's where you want to be. I never got there with my startup, um, but I love to see that, you know, when I'm talking to other founders. That's great. I love that. Zoe, what about you? Um, that's such a good answer, I think. Um, Isaiah, I, I really, really like that. Um, right, the, the, the confidence, the comfort um, that then gives the investor the confidence also that you have thought about kind of that you live and breathe this and have thought about all these different angles and don't feel threatened by questions about competition, for example. Um, I think another strong, strong opinions about where the space or the industry is going um, overall, I think valuable for uh, entrepreneurs. Also, I think a big part of um, what got me into into VC is having kind of a strong thesis thesis statements about industries, about trends, um, not just kind of identifying trends that are there today, but what are the second and third and and fourth order implications of uh, the maybe early stage changes that we're seeing today. That's a great point. Not looking at your company with complete tunnel vision. Like not only do you need to see competitors, but you need to see the industry. Like that helps you figure out why are people going to need this? Like how much is of the market is available? That's a great point. Um, Sunny, what about you? Any advice that you would give to up and coming entrepreneurs or future investors? Yeah. On the entrepreneur piece, I think the confidence, you know, to, to my friends also came from, understanding this is your baby, right? You're devoting your, your life to it. And, uh, you know, if you're talking to a VC firm, they're all about growth, growth, growth. Um, demonstrate, you know, why this is going to be big, why this is your baby, what inspired you to do it, and what's the impact of what you're doing too, beyond just making money. I think the founders who are talking about the impact they're going to have in the world or the changes they're going to make often go the farthest. Um, so just letting that passion shine in and, and maybe even be the source of your confidence, you know, this is your baby, you know it, right? This is what you've built and now show us why it's so awesome and why you're going to be the one to take it this far and, uh, you know, hit a home run on, on something that you're, is becoming your life and, and kind of your full-time job. Um, so I think that passion, you know, not, not being shamed by it or embarrassed, but really embracing it and, uh, you know, making it clear where this is going. Um, and if the investor isn't open-minded to that, then I think they're, they're just not the right fit. Um, so don't have to go with just any investor. They have to you know believe in your vision and, believe in you as a person. And if they're kind of being reflective about your passion, I think that's pretty clear about the, the fit not being right. Um, in terms of people looking to go into VC, I think, uh, you know, went straight to VC um, after doing consulting. I think there are people who do consulting, investment banking, and have the typical kind of pipeline route. Um, I also think people who 
run successful startups often join the firms um, that invest in them. Um, so, you know, the experience of actually running a startup, scaling it is so, it's such a great selling point as an investor because you've been through it and you know, I haven't been through it. So I, I don't have that selling point, but I know that people who do like Isaiah, um, you know, are really empowered by it. The fact that they understand the day-to-day life of a, a founder, um, that goes such a long way. So, um, you know, the, the venture capital world is something that you can always do after running your own business and scaling and exiting or, or even starting your own fund, right? If you make it really big. Um, so I think um, the, the operating experience is actually super valuable for what we do um, and sometimes can make the difference between who wins the deal and who doesn't. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you just brought up with the, the passion there is, you know, this whole time you talked about the do's, the don'ts of presenting, um, but that's a really big one kind of beyond all the technical stuff is have passion in what you're doing. And I think that's a great note to end on, great piece of advice. So Isaiah, Zoe, Sunny, thank you so much for participating today and sharing your expertise and experience. Uh, It's been great. I'll definitely keep all of this in mind. And I'm sure that all the entrepreneurs and investors will as well that are watching this. So again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great discussion. Yeah, thanks.